We've had a lot of time to talk, and uh, one of the things that I read about you is that you grew up in Ohio in the 1960s, and I was wondering how that came into play in your career as a director. You all just thought, man, she's really old, <laughs> didn't you? <laughs> really? Did you I have know, to right? start out I with did, that? I, that was not the best thing. <laughs> um, I, yes, I think it did have an impact because I uh, grew up in a place that was like... Um, Mayberry, you know, it was a sweet little town and nice people and uh, very Midwest mentality of pull yourself up by your bootstraps and keep going and be nice to everybody. And uh, that's who I am and that's who I still am. You know, there was a time when I started directing when I thought I had to be uh, tough and um, ego filled. And then I learned it's better to be myself. Mm -hmm. and who I am is informed by where I grew up, yeah, yeah, most definitely. How did it all start? How did you become a director? I have a great story. <laughs> um, I worked at the PBS station in Bowling Green, which was a great education because I got to do everything there. And when I was a freshman, I met a woman who was a senior also working at the station. Three years later, she came back to work at the PBS station doing a documentary. In the meantime, because she had written a fan letter to Mary Tyler Moore, which must have been a great one, <laughs> she got a job originally as um, an accountant at MTM Productions. By the time she came back, three years later, she was story editor on a show called Lou Grant. So uh, I approached her, her name was Michelle Gallery, and I said, Michelle, I'm coming out to California, can I call you? Yes, so I arrived on a Friday, on Monday I had an inter interview, on Wednesday a secretary quit, and I started the following Monday as a secretary to Bruce Paltrow and Mark Tinker on a show called The White Shadow. This is, <laughs> here I go, being old again. <laughs> that was 1978. And I uh, didn't know anything. In fact, <laughs> I threw away all of Bruce's correspondence the first year because I didn't know I was supposed to keep it. I had no idea how to even be a secretary, really. Wasn't trained to be one. Mm -hmm. um, but I typed every script by hand mm. um, and, all, and answered all the phones and uh, learned and learned and learned and stayed with Bruce and Mark for 10 years because they made a show after The White Shadow called Saint Elsewhere. And at that time I became the associate producer which meant I supervised all the post-production on that show. And that's where I started directing. So it was a really straight line. I was at MTM for 10 years. Yeah, that's fascinating. I hope you, so. uh, <laughs> well, it is. It's it's interesting. It, most people look at how do we get into this business, and uh, you know, less than sixteen percent of the directing field is females. I owe that to Bruce. He was known for giving people a shot um, as a director um, at that time on this show called The White Shadow. It was about a basketball team, an inner city basketball team with a white coach, and. Um, several of those actors got their opportunity to direct, and that includes Kevin Hooks and Tim Van Patten and Thomas Carter, all of whom are extremely well-known directors today. And then there were some other people too, including me. Mm -hmm. And I'm just blessed that he gave me a shot. I was 28, and when I look back on that now, I think, really? He, he gave a 28-year-old who knew basically nothing mm -hmm. a shot to direct? But it's not that I knew nothing, because as an associate producer, Supervising post-production, that's a great way to learn how to direct because you learn how to visually tell a story. And I took an acting class for five years so that I would be able to communicate with actors. And I was on set as much as I could be. So I, I, I feel like I was prepared when I say I was 28 and I knew nothing. What I mean by that is I was young and I was, and you don't know so much about life. I know a lot more about life now than mm -hmm. I did then. I've been in the business 30 years. I've been around a lot of directors when I was in Los Angeles, a lot of male directors. But uh, your personality, you're, you're a very, very nice person. <laughs> there's, no, there's no air about you. Thank you. And I just, you know, uh, we were talking backstage before we came out here, and you were telling me that you just were on uh, Saint, uh, what is it, uh, Parenthood. Mm -hmm. And you met uh, Craig T. Nelson. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that? Well, Craig, Nelson, Craig T. Nelson has had a long and esteemed career as an actor and 
um, any actor, when a new director comes in, is going to want to know, can I trust this person? Will she protect me so that I don't look stupid? Will she be asking me to do things that make me feel stupid? Does she understand the script? Does she understand the story? Will she give me good direction? Um, and uh, I went to Craig's trailer uh, the day before we started shooting, just to introduce myself. And we started talking about the script and about some ideas he had. And he asked me questions to which I think I had the answers he was looking for. So that when we started shooting the next day, um, he felt, OK, good. She knows what she's doing. Uh, I'm safe. It's all right. right. But every actor is going to test the director because because they need to. They need to know that they're, they're safe and they won't look stupid. Mm -hmm. Obviously. You told me that you're getting ready to do an episode of Heart of Dixie. Mm -hmm. And you told me that you got the last 20 scripts. Is that right, for research? Um, I could have. I, I asked for the last five. The last five. Before mine. Mm -hmm. OK. And that's the research you do to go into an episode. I look at episodes if there are episodes to view. Um, if there aren't, if it's the beginning of a season, I read scripts. Mm -hmm. Or I look at previous, um, previous you know, seasons worth, yeah. Because as a freelance director, it's my job to jump into a show and swim with it, swim with the current, not go against it, understand what the show is, what kind of story they're telling, um, maintain the style of the show, and do the best job that I can with my creative vision while honoring the show that it is. Okay. Uh, most of my students are sitting out here, a lot of directing students, and uh, the book that they are um, reading right now is called Directors Tell the Story. Bethany co-wrote the book and uh, wanted you to tell us why. What, how did that come about? You know, uh, because I'm a freelancer, I go around from show to show to show. And very often, uh, both cast and crew will say to me, you won't believe what this last director did or didn't do, meaning they weren't very good at their job. And um, I kind of took that personally. You know, I felt bad that I was being judged against these people who were, who were so lame. <laughs> um, and uh, so I thought, well, what can I do about that? I can sit around and complain, or I can do something. And so what I did was, with my uh, co-writer, Mary Lou Belli, I wrote everything I knew about the business. It's a very specific business um, that you have to be in to understand, but I thought, well, I'll, I'll write it down. I'll give everybody everything I know. And also talk about the way I think the job should be done, mm. which uh, requires a lot of preparation and a lot of caring. Because a lot of directors today, I felt like their perspective was, oh, I've been on sets before. I can direct. You know, I've been an actor. I can direct. I've been an editor. I can direct. I, I've been a, a writer. I can direct. And that's so offensive to me because there is a craft to it. And people don't want to put the effort in. Um, so I want to teach people to put the effort in and do it the right way. And also be nice and kind and loving while you're doing it. Right, and that leads me into my next question, which is you make it a point when you get on set to learn every crew member's name. Yeah, sometimes I, I don't learn all the grips and electrics because they come and they go and they're off in the shadows and I, I may not meet all of them. But yeah, I try to, to know everybody and what their job is and because everybody contributes in mm -hmm. such a wonderful way. Um, um, that doesn't seem like it should be a big deal to get to know their names. Well, not to everyone, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and when we say uh, that's about 50 people on a crew. So there's a lot of uh, aspiring directors sitting in the room right now. What should they do to prepare other than going to film school to become a director? Shoot, 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 shoot. Yeah. Um, when I started in the business, you know, it was all on film, and that was a much more difficult thing to do, but you guys can shoot movies on your phones and cut it together on your computer. And the more you do it, it's like anything else. You know, athletes have to practice. My son is a pitcher, and he has to practice pitching all the time um, to get better at it. And directors have to shoot to get better at it. 
um, uh, you learn by doing. Mm -hmm. Film school is great, and I'm sure you get to shoot a lot in film school, <coughs> but you just ought to keep shooting. It would be best if you would write and shoot so that you really understand story structure and what makes a good scene structurally, what elements you need. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing that I would say is you have to understand, having done that, let's say you've shot 50 shorts um, between film school and, and what happens after film school. You're still going to have to start at the bottom if you get in the business. You're still going to have to start as a production assistant. You're still going to have to get people's coffee um, and their lunches. Um, it's not very dignified, but that, again, is another opportunity to learn. Bless you. <laughs> Thank you. You're not going to get in uh, anywhere else but at the bottom, but that's great. When you start at the bottom, then you can start thinking, which direction, bless you again, which direction do I want to go? <laughs> Uh, do, I want to, do I want to get to know the writers or do I want to get to know the editors? Mm. Or do I want to get to know the director of photography? How, which way, which path do I want to take mm -hmm. to work my way into directing? Because you don't go from PA to director. No. Right? No. You right. don't. Uh, let's see here. I had to, uh, <laughs> you once said... <laughs> Always create your best work and collaborate in a meaningful, respectful manner. And you followed it up with, if you can't collaborate, you shouldn't be in filmmaking. Right. There are um, individual ways to be an artist, obviously. You could write a book. You could paint a painting. But filmmaking is um, a collaborative business. And especially in television, where there is a, a hierarchy that has to do with the showrunner, that is the head writer is the, is the boss, and there are other writers, and there are other directors, and there are other producers, and so there's these elements that are sort of above you, if you want to put it that way, and there's a lot, and you're sort of up here, and then there's the cast, which is such an essential part of it, and then there's the crew, and you can't make this by yourself. You can't make this show, you can't make this film by yourself, what you want to do is be the cheerleader and say, we're going to make this fabulous thing. And I have such a great idea for how I want to do this. Come along with me. Come with me. Let me show you. Will you help me do this? Will you help me make this shot? Will you help me uh, tell the story with your wonderful performance? Will you help me with editing this together so beautifully? Um, because you, not only do you have to collaborate, but appreciate what everybody brings to the party. Mm, good point. You, I, I talk about taking acting classes. I tell the directors, if you want to direct, you, you really should take some classes. And you took classes with Gordon Hunt. Mm -hmm. you tell us about that. Um, actors have a vocabulary. How many people in here are, are actors as well? Anybody? Good. All right, actors have a vocabulary, um, and directors have to understand that vocabulary. The job of a director is to uh, watch the scene unfold in front of you and think, OK, is it good? Is it great? Wonderful, let's shoot it. If it's not great, if it's not good, what is wrong with it? How can I assess what the problem is? And once the director has assessed what the problem is, now how do I communicate that to the actors? And oftentimes, directors will walk up to actors and give them this big, long speech about where they, their character just was and where they're going and whatever. And the actor's eyes glaze over. And if you. Very often, there's a simple phrase you can use to achieve what you, the director, need to achieve. Um, and I began to learn that with my acting teacher, whose name was Gordon Hunt. Um, wonderful, wonderful acting teacher, still working in the business today. Um, and uh, I think of him a lot. His, you know what his best word was, if you really did great in his class, was dandy. If you got a dandy, you knew that you had just killed the scene. <laughs> Sometimes I still say that to actors. Yeah. You taught the pilot program of the Warner Brothers Directing Workshop. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about the program? Tell us about the pilot and where you're at right now with the second group coming in. Um, in the past bunch of years, there hadn't been any new emerging directors working in television because studio networks and producers didn't want to give newcomers a chance because the stakes were so high financially and the risk was so high in terms of 
handing over an episode of a show to a less experienced person. There's less time and less money now than there used to be for directing episodic. So people like myself who have a lot of experience who know how to get the shots and know how to get performance and can work within the time limit, that's great for us, but not great for new people. So um, as a matter of fact, this year's contract um, negotiation uh, for the Directors Guild with the producers, um, part of what they decided was that every studio will have a directing workshop program to help um, emerging directors get their foot in the door. So Warner Brothers started last year, and uh, it was a, the class was, or the, the group was divided into half took my class, half was determined they didn't really need the class, that they had enough experience. So we used my book as the template, and we worked at Warner Brothers. It was a 12-week program on Saturdays, and um, we were using a Heart of Dixie script, and we're on their sets, and this year we're going to use a Pretty Little Liars script and be on their sets. And so the, the candidates get to prep a script that is block and shot listed and understand everything about it and work with actors on the sets, not the actors from the show, oh, okay. but actors that I bring into the class, but working on the sets for which the script was written. Um, and uh, the idea is that when they leave the class, they're prepared as best as they can to now begin to shadow on other shows and hopefully get a job. I mean, the idea is to help them get a directing assignment on a Warner Brothers show. And you said that several people from the first group actually did, did direct some episodes. As I understand it, nine people from the last year, 2013, have gotten a directing assignment, yes. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of these people in the audience right now are thinking, okay, how do I become a part of that program? <laughs> <laughs> um, go to the Warner Brothers website, and uh, actually the application time is right now. But you, none of you guys would qualify. This, is, this would be after you've been in the business for a while. Um, you can look and see what the requirements are, but you need a short film that's played in a major festival or an episode or a national commercial. Okay. The idea is to take people who have graduated from film school and have worked somewhat in the business but need to really get, now get a foot in the door of, I can say, the real world of uh, episodic television to help them get in and get going. Okay. Top three favorite actors that you've worked Shoot. with. <laughs> I could have said 10. I know. I wish you would have told me you were going to ask that I question. I know. <laughs> I had to throw a zinger in somewhere. Um, <laughs> well, I love Sally Field. Um, I worked with her a lot on a show called Brothers and Sisters. And she doesn't suffer fools gladly, so it's a good thing I'm not a fool. Um, uh, just because she has so much experience and knows what she's doing so much, and I learned a lot from her. She was, she's just really gifted And she's a director, actress. too. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know how, how much she's directed. She didn't direct on Brothers and Sisters. I know. No. You mentioned Robert Downey Jr. before. Mm. This, that was on Ally McBeal. Do you guys remember that show? Yes. For a, for a year, he was on Ally McBeal, and then the next year, the person who took his slot was John Bon Jovi, so I worked with him, too. <laughs> Um, as a love interest for Allie McBeal. Um, the, the, my story about that is that when he came on the show, uh, the producers said, leave him alone, let him do what he does. We all know he's genius, um, but TV is a new realm to him. We're trying to you know, give, him, give him some space. And um, I tried that, and it didn't work very well, because I needed to be a director, and he needed to be directed. Mm. And once I stepped in and started doing my job, we had a lovely relationship, and it was fun. Denzel Washington, um, you did, may not have known this, started in television on the show that I first worked on, St. Elsewhere. And I owe him a lot, because uh, the very first episode I directed, this A storyline was about his character and Alfred Woodard's character falling in love. Mm -hmm. And the second episode I directed, those characters broke up. And so it was a gift to me. Um, it was like director proof. There was mm -hmm. nothing I could, I couldn't screw him up, you know? <laughs> um, and he was wonderful. And a couple years ago, we did a, um, a short film about Bruce Paltrow, who was a mentor to so many people. 
And Denzel came in for an interview on that, and I got to say to him, thank you, you got my career off to a great start. And he was like, really? I, it was just an episode to me. Mm. And I'm yeah, thank you, though, you know. I will always remember how wonderful he was. Yeah. You were telling me backstage that, uh, you know, it's tough for a new director. And I remember we were talking about you being challenged after 200 episodes. You would think there comes a point where it's like, oh, it's Bethany Rooney. But uh, <laughs> it's, a new, it's a new show Sadly, every time. No. And you're the new guy, you're the new person on the show because right. the shows are going on sometimes for five seasons. Right. And so what is it like? <laughs> for a young actor, or excuse me, for a young director to walk onto a set, if you're challenged with 200 episodes, what's it like for them? <sighs> you guys gotta be strong. <laughs> you gotta be tough. And you ha but you also have to be available. And um, the main thing to know is that you have to prep the material and have the answer to every question that an actor would ask. But everybody is going to test you. Everybody is afraid to put themselves in your hands. And not only the actors, but the producers as well. Here comes this stranger, and, and they're handing over a script and saying, do the best you can, and I hope it's really good. Um, so they're going to test you as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I understand that, and I think anybody would. It's just that you, you have to do your homework, and you have to know what you're doing. And you have to have um, a vision for the episode. You have to know not only what story the performances are supposed to be revealing, but how you intend to shoot it um, visually. How are you telling the story? Mm -hmm. um, it's a tough business to be in. And I have to say, um, after my first episode, Bruce Paltrow called me into his office and yelled at me up one side and down the other and said, you're not the captain unless you stir the, steer that boat around. And he was really, um, well, uh, I, it, I was in tears, of course. Um, and looking back on it, well, well, let me continue that. And then, the, so I was devastated. And the next day I went into his office and said, please give me another chance. I'll do better. And he did. He gave me another episode later that season. But I think that his motivation in doing that was to say, this is a tough business, little girl. You're going to get yelled at a lot. And if you can't take it, don't get in it. You shouldn't be here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What, uh, is another zinger for you, out of all 200 episodes, there usually is an episode that you remember as being your favorite, meant the most to you. Is there one that stands out? Um, I get asked this periodically. and. It sounds ingenuous, but it, it's true. Whatever I'm working on in that moment is my favorite episode because I have to embrace every show a thousand percent in order to do a good job on it. So even if I uh, go into a show thinking, uh, this isn't very good or very interesting or very, I'm certainly not going to win an Emmy for directing this thing, um, by the end, I love it. I embrace it. I think it's the best show I ever worked on. <laughs> Uh, so right now, that's Parenthood. Mm. Uh, before that, I did Nashville, mm. which was a wonderful show to do. Um, so that's where I am with it right now. I mean, I don't, ha I don't have an episode from, you know, 1989 to tell you about. Mm -hmm. I just love where I am right now. Yeah. Episodic as opposed to feature film. Yeah. What's what it is it like? Yeah. Okay, so here's how it works. Um, I get the script, which will be usually around 53 pages, usually around 40 scenes, um, depending on the show. Uh oh. It came Sorry. off. Yeah. Um, unless it's a show like Scandal, which they'll have 75 scenes, it's much harder to do. And you have seven days to prep and seven, eight, or nine days to shoot, depending on the budget. Um, in that seven days of prep, um, the work that has to be done is to pick the locations at which we're going to shoot. There's a location manager who, who has done the pre-work, but then the director selects the locations. Have meetings with every department to talk about which way you're going to go with what the script has asked for. In other words, if, if it says, um, 
it's, uh, well, in my last episode of Parenthood, I had a salvage yard. Okay, so where are we gonna shoot that? What is it gonna look like? Is it a big one? Is it a little one? Is it, a, is it you know, dirty and dusty? Of course, a salvage yard probably would be. Um, but, you know, what do they wear when they go to the salvage yard? And what props do they have? And, and um, what are all the decisions that have to be made? You do that in prep. Um, also, during prep, you cast the guest parts. Um, you acquaint yourself with the show and its sets and its people and its cast and crew. And the big job is that you block and shot list the script that you have so that you have thought about the story you're telling and know how you intend to shoot it. It may morph and change when you get on the set um, because the actors will have ideas and the DP may have some ideas that are helpful to you. Um, but you have to have a plan to work with. So you have seven days to do that stuff. And then you start shooting. And each day you have to shoot between four and seven scenes, usually about seven pages, seven to nine pages a, a day. Mm. And you have to do that in a 12-hour day. And then you, um, at the end of that seven, eight or nine days of shooting, if you're a freelancer, your job is done, except now you go to editing. So editing by Director's Guild rules, you have four days to be with the editor. Um, hopefully, if you've shot it well, it doesn't take that long. And then you turn it over to the producers, and your participation in that episode is done. It's done. So do you, do you sit in the editing bay with the directors? Yeah. The editors come in as a part of the show, and they stay on the show. So when you meet an editor, has that editor been directing the entire series, or are they brought on individually for each episode? No, there are usually three editors or three editing teams mm -hmm. for a show, and they rotate. And um, um, so, just as when I came into prep, I met my first AD, who was also part of the show. Mm -hmm. I come in by myself and adapt to them. Um, I carry nobody with me. Those people are all employed by the show, and I'm the newcomer. Mm -hmm. um, so I go into the editing bay of the editor who's assigned to that episode in rotation. Mm -hmm. And I don't usually give them any notes um, from production. I want the editor to look at the footage with an open mind and find uh, you know, what it's meant to be. However, I shoot in a really specific way. I always know exactly what the opening shot is. I always know exactly where I'm cutting out of that opening shot to my second shot. And by the way, that's one of the biggest tips I can give you as a director. That's an important thing to know. And uh, I always know what the ending shot is. So most of the time when I go into editing and see the editor's cut structurally, it is what I intended it to be. Mm -hmm. And then it's just a matter of refining it. Mm -hmm. Shoot for the edit. Yeah, I, I always, it's always cut together in my head before I begin shooting, and as I'm shooting, I'm checking it, you know? Yeah. Do you, uh, when I lived in Los Angeles, I remember watching a lot of the shows that I was auditioning for as an actor. I would keep up, and I used to do VHS tapes. I had them stacked all over them, <laughs> written. It was a horrible time. But, you guys are so lucky you don't have to deal with that stuff now. Yeah, but as a director, you know you're coming up on Heart of Dixie, and that's coming up. You've already worked on it before, but if there's an episode of a show that you've never worked on before, are you keeping up with that as you go throughout the year, or do you wait till you're getting close and then... I wait till I get close, and then I ask them for um, a, a link or DVDs of um, episodes that they have to show me, mostly because I have to compartmentalize my own time. You know, I just came from Nashville, and then I went to Parenthood. So I couldn't deal with Parenthood till I was done with Nashville. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I do, I do. When you started, you told me backstage that uh, it was 9%. 9. 9% nine. 9 of television was, was directed by women at that time. Now it's a whopping 16%. Yeah, gone all the way up to 16%. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually am the beneficiary of that. And I'm grateful in some ways because oftentimes, very often, I'm the only woman out of their slate of directors. Or sometimes there'll be two of us 
or three of us. So it's been, it's been beneficial to me in my career, but for women wanting to get into it, uh, women and minorities, actually. Um, minority numbers are even less than for women. So basically, it's a white man's world. Mm -hmm. And what's it like being in that white man's world? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the only thing that I can do, the two things that I can do is be the best director that I can be. Because they're going to lump us all together, you know. The last woman we had here, mm -hmm. last woman director we had here, blah, blah, blah. They don't say the last man director we had here. Men don't get lumped together like women do or minorities do. Mm -hmm. So what I can do is be the best director that I can be first. And secondly, I can share what I know, which is why I'm here and why I wrote the book. So that other people, when they get the chance, will be prepared to do the job in the best way they can. So that it, see, the reason that it exists is uh, white men are in power and they don't want to share that with people who are unlike them. They want to be with their buddies, their homies. <laughs> it's just, that's just what it is. So um, if I, as a woman director, do a great job for them, then maybe they'll think that women directors aren't such a bad thing. Or if a African American director comes in, they might not and does a good job, they might not think that's such a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So, we're going to try and make progress, a little bit at a time. Nine percent to sixteen percent. Well, yes, you know, let's get that up to seventeen. It's going up. Let's it's not go going to, down. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, but uh, for a lot of years, it was really consistently around ten percent. Was it? Yeah. Okay. So you know, year a day in the life of a director. You've talked a little bit about it. You've talked about your pre-production. You go out, like you said, for, uh, for uh, Parenthood, you had to go to a, a salvage yard. Yeah, not only a salvage yard, but the Pacific Ocean and an ATV park. Um, that was pretty much it. As a, oh, no, and a, um, a restaurant downtown and Sunset Boulevard in um, Silver Lake. And if you, it's a lot of locations. If, you're, if you, you have scouts that do that for you, and they come to you and they say, here's what we're thinking. Yeah. If you look at it and go, that's not what I've envisioned. Right. It changes. Yeah. It's my decision. It's your decision. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And that's all in the pre-production phase? Of, mm hmm Okay. And so at the end of that pre-production time, we're all ready to go. Every department is ready to go. Everything has been prepared. You know, I've looked at wardrobe for each of the characters. I've looked at all the props. Um, I, we have visited the locations and I have said, okay, this is the direction that we're going to shoot so you can park the trucks over there and you can cable um, from the generator from over here and um, everything is, you know, everybody is ready to go. And then we jump in and start shooting and then those people who work in prep turn over and start prepping the next episode and looking for locations and casting actors and the, this whole process goes on for 22 episodes. Sure. For a long time. It's a long haul. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, everybody works pretty long hours. Usually we start at 7 a.m. and hope to wrap by 8 p.m. Are you the last one off the ship? Um, no, because I don't have to wrap up cable and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> There's people for that. There's people for that. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, another zinger question for you. All uh, right. <laughs> I know you like these, so. The most... Uh, difficult episode in the most, you know. Okay, I, I don't can, mean just in I, actors, yeah. Yeah, 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 okay. I can say this because it was a long time ago and most, most people aren't um, around anymore. But um, in that first episode of St. Elsewhere that I directed, um, one of the leading actors who is no longer with us um, was extremely unhappy that a 28-year-old woman who'd never directed before was now there in front of him saying action and cut. Mm. And to this day, he's, he was, that is the most unkind person I've had on my very first episode. And then, in my first year as a freelancer, I directed this show called The Slap Maxwell Story. And it starred, it was a half hour single camera, and it starred Dabney Coleman, who was a lovely gentleman um, most of the time, but sometimes wasn't. Um, 
I directed eight of those in my first year as a freelancer because the producers realized to put a 28-year-old, well, I was 29 then, whoo, um, <laughs> young woman with this man was great because at his heart, he was a Southern gentleman and he couldn't really be mean to me. He made me cry once on my first episode and um, he apologized the next day and was never mean to me again and we got along great. And I have to say also, that is the first and last time that I cried on set because wow. it's not okay to do it. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name's Michelle. Hi, Michelle. And, uh, I think it's really cool that you're a woman in the industry. It's like really hard. Obviously, as you said, it was only 16%. But my question is, is there a TV show that maybe you'd want to work on or that has passed already and you didn't get the chance to work on and you regret it? Um, you get pigeonholed in this business and what I direct mostly is family dramas. Um, you, you won't see my name on a procedural like Law and Order um, because I haven't done one and it's the catch-22 of, even though I've directed 200 episodes, they don't think I can direct an episode of Law and Order because I haven't directed procedurals. Um, and uh, same thing goes for action, which has more to do with being a woman. They think a woman can't really handle that. However, um, this year I directed Criminal Minds and I directed Arrow, both of which have a lot of action in them. So I feel like, whoo, I'm starting to break out a little. <laughs> yeah, Arrow is awesome. It's really great. Thanks for asking. Um, hello, my name's Cameron Messer. I'm a film student. Hi. Um, I was asked by a couple of my classmates, I'm just starting out, but they asked me to direct a web series. And currently I'm taking on directing, assistant, director, and producer. Do you think it's, and do you have any advice for someone who's taken on multiple roles? Good luck. <laughs> the issue is that the jobs are very different and require different skills. And um, you will find out what you are good at and what you're not good at, and what, you, what it is attractive to you and what isn't. Be, like, I would never want to be a producer for all the tea in China, because a producing job requires different skills mm -hmm. um, than a director. And believe me, I know the value of a good and strong producer and I'm grateful to them. I just don't want to do what they do. I want to do what I do that uses the skills that I have. So have fun, um, try to get a lot of sleep, <laughs> and um, you'll find you know, what works best for you. You're welcome. Hi, um, I'm graduating in March, and I wrote down one question, but I think I'm gonna ask a different one. <laughs> um, I'm looking into doing like, I want to direct, and as a female director, that's hard. But, um, wow, I'm really nervous right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I keep getting told, because I can edit really well, to look for editing jobs. And I'm thinking the more on-set experience, the better. Am I wrong in thinking that? Editing is actually a great way to get into directing. Um, because, as I was saying, you have to get in some way, right? You can't go from PA to director. So if you're an editor, produce. There's two good things about it. One is producers will know that your sense of storytelling is good. And secondly, you spend a lot of time with the producer in your little quiet editing room, and they get to know you, and you get to know them. And the, the reason that's important is for somebody to reach back and give you a hand and, let me, and say, let me help you jump from this to directing, which is what it requires for everybody, if they know you and care about you, you have a stronger chance of that happening. Um, you, you were saying that um, like first ADs and stuff are on a show. Are DPs the same way, or do you yeah. have different DPs every time you work with them, and how does that work? Everybody is there except me. The DP is there, the crew is there, the cast is there, the producers are there, the writers are there, the post-production people are there. I'm the one who comes in and am expected to be the leader of that episode, not knowing anybody when I get there. It's um, challenging, but I embrace it as, you know, that's one of the cool things about, about being a freelance episodic director. Not a lot of people could do it. So, um, yes, I have to get to know everybody quickly and relate to them quickly and open the lines of communication quickly. 
here. This side. Hi, uh, I had a quick question. Um, you talk about jumping into a series, um, you know, halfway through it. Is there is that typical for episodic television, or do you, is there uh, instances where a director will stay on throughout the whole series? Um, sometimes there is a person who has a producer credit who is their um, regular director, but in single camera dramas, hour long shows, um, that person may direct four episodes out of the season. And then they may have a few directors that direct two episodes and a bunch of directors that direct one. So out of 22 episodes, generally, there are 10 to 13 different people, different directors, who direct within that season. Now, it's different in sitcom, multi-camera world, where they often have the same director for the entire season or just a few. And the reason that it's different is in multicam, they do it like a play. They rehearse for three days and then they uh, do a, a tech rehearsal day and then they shoot one day in front of a live audience. And then the next week they start over again. But in single camera, as you'll recall, I said I have seven days of prep. Well, while I'm prepping, somebody else is shooting and somebody else is in post-production. So the best you could have, if you wanted to have consistent directors, would be to have three but it doesn't work that way really because um, they want to bring in new blood, they want to bring in um, creative vision to sort of mix it up a little bit. And um, they want to disperse <coughs> the shows amongst many directors. So yes, there is somebody, but again, that person may only do three or four. Hi, my name is Nabila. Hi. I had a question. What advice would you give young women coming into the TV industry, television? No, it's going to be a hard, long road, first off. Um, understand that an episodic director really won't come into her own until she's... This is true for men, too, for the most part, until they're a little older and more experienced. Well, what experience? Either the jobs that you hold between PA and directing, whether you're an editor or a writer or a crew person or whatever, um, and hopefully during that time you're shooting as much as you can shoot and cutting it together and submitting to festivals and doing that kind of stuff. So um, my advice would be hang in there. Keep your enthusiasm, know you have something to give, and just be aware that your path is your path, and you'll get there. Hi, my name is Nicolas Perez, and I'm a field student. Uh, I would like to know if, do you think there is a big difference between directing television to directing movies? No, I use the exact same process, exact same as any film director uses. What I do and what Steven Spielberg does same process. The differences, of course, are how much money he has to spend, how much time. It's a money and time issue. And then the creative vision. Is, is Steven Spielberg a better storyteller than I am? Probably so. Um, but no, in terms of learning the craft, there is no difference between television and film. Hi, my name is John Haight. I'm a film bachelor student. Um, what advice would you give to try and get the best performance out of your talent? Man, I could teach a class on that for a semester. Come out more. here and do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the best advice I have is to understand that you know what the story is and you need to give your actors a job to do within that scene going to intention, going to subtext, with a verb. In other words, this person's job is to kick this person out of the room. This person's job is to get Stay this person to accept that they love them, okay? Talking about non-specific sort of amorphous stuff is not helpful. Specific, grounded, verb-oriented intention will in achieve what you want to achieve. 
My name is Isabella, and you said about how hard it is for a female to work in this area. How about an international female? How hard is that? You speak English, so that's fine. That's a good start. Um, listen, all anybody wants to know is, are you good? Do you, can you tell a story well? So if you can prove that, being international shouldn't, shouldn't be a problem for you, um, as long as you have your you know, visa, green card, whatever it is that allows you to stay, um, there's no difference. <laughs> I mean, in their mind, a woman is a woman. Whether you're from Ohio or wherever you're from, it really doesn't matter. Did you yourself have an agent before getting accepted to the Guild's um, Director's Guild? Or do you think that we should, as graduating students, whether it's creative writing or directing, get an agent before coming to the Guild? Um, the two things are not really connected, Director's Guild and having an agent. Um, the way it happened for me was because I was on staff on a show and directed an episode, an agent watched it, saw it on the air, called me up and said, hey, you directed an episode, can I represent you? And that was the beginning of it. Um, you're not gonna get into the DGA as a director until you have an assignment. You can't just go like join up because you wanna join up. So the thing to concentrate on is getting the work. And then the work will lead you to becoming a member of the Directors Guild, and hopefully the work will lead you to getting an agent. How important is uh, the relationship between a director and a DP, specifically uh, you being a freelance uh, director? Um, crucial. How important is it is crucial. Um, the question is, how do I communicate what it is I'm looking to do in a way that that <coughs> DP can understand it and give me what I'm looking for? And how, do, how is my relationship in terms of, are we going to be friends? Are we going to be, do we see the show in the same way? Am I asking him, and I say him because I've only ever worked with one female DP in all of these years. Um, uh, are we gonna see the show in the same way or am I asking him to do stuff that he feels is counterintuitive to the show since I'm a freelancer? So um, as with everybody on the crew, it's incumbent upon me to connect with him right away as best as I can and hopefully have a good relationship, a creative relationship, and a kind, and, and I would say, I try to have a loving relationship with everybody. Because you're uh, jumping into a show that's already like developed, um, would you say it, you give them more, um, I guess, leeway to do their own thing compared to like if you were starting uh, a film or you're starting a show with them that's not already established? Um, y yes. I've directed a lot of TV movies and so um, I understand what that is like to start from scratch and have nothing um, uh, already established. Um, but the way that it works in episodic television when things are already established is what I can offer is a even more specific um, way to make things marginally better. But marginally better is great because obviously they know their characters. Obviously, if they're on crew, they know the way that the show is shot. But I can be a new eye and a new voice to keep them on the same track, but, but just say, hey, I'm noticing something that maybe you hadn't noticed because I'm a new eye here. And as with everything in this business, the more specific you can be down to the, and I mean, in editing, it's, you know, a frame makes a difference. In performance, let's say I give them a note about, just have a little bit of sense memory about this moment, calling back to something, um, that will make that moment better. And any moment, that I can make better, then I've done my job.
Why are there some shows that you've done more episodes for, and can you just touch on some of the shows that you haven't talked about yet? Or, Well, the, it, it's, there's a lot of factors that go into it. it. Partly it's a matter of fit. As a freelance director, am I a good fit with a show? Do, they, do I like them? Do they like me? Does my style mesh with theirs? Um, shows that I've done a lot of are Desperate Housewives, Brothers and Sisters, um, um, Allie McBeal before that. Um, and on those shows, I was just a good fit with them. And sometimes I come in and do an episode and it goes well, um, but, but that's the end of our involvement. And that could be because, for any number of factors, it could be because they have, it's, uh, they have an assignment, they go, should we hire Bethany or should we hire Joe? Joe. Not, not for any, I mean, most of the time, it's so, it's so subtextual. If somebody goes uh, to someone else and says, um, what can you tell me about Bethany? Did you have a good experience with her? And if they just kind of go, that's the end of it. I'm dead. They're not going to hire me. And they didn't even have to say anything bad. And it's all under the surface like that. It's all, um, and it's all based on subjective opinion. So when it's a good fit and I match up with the show well, that's great. And if it's a one-time deal, that's fine. Because in every, that's just the way the business is. And I will take everything I can learn from that episode and do the best I can and onward I go. And I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but okay. Well, but in that, uh, you have worked on several episodes of other shows. Mm -hmm. What is it that brings you back? Is it, is it your interest? Is it, is it the fact that the show says, you know, we really like Bethany. We like what her episode brought to the series. Mm -hmm. What is it that brings you back? Is it, you know, because you have management that gets Fields questions or Fields offers. Yeah. Okay, so when that happens. Sometimes it's scheduling. A lot of times it's scheduling because I get, right now I'm booked up till uh, the first week in June. Okay. And starting in May, after the upfronts, they'll start booking directors for um, July to December. And then around in November, they'll book again for the spring. So it could be that a show wants me. Well, Parenthood is a great example. They have asked, this is the, the show's fifth season, and they have asked me to direct it the last three years, but I haven't been available. Mm. So now the this timing. year, the timing worked out great. They book me in whatever time slot, you know, episode 19 is from this date to this date. Great. Now I have to fill the next spot after that. But if somebody else calls and they want to, they just have that, their one slot open, but it overlaps the dates I'm already booked, then we have to say no. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And the weird thing, the crazy thing about it is every show is fighting for directors at exactly the same time. Mm. Once the upfronts are over in May, every show is trying to fill their schedule and calling every agent in town. They have their wish list. And here's another thing. Directors have to be approved by the studio and by the network as well. So there's a, it's a fairly short list, you know, if you're on the, you could be on the ABC list but not be on the NBC list. It's just all weird. So you're DGA. I am. And yet, even though you're, all of the directors are under that umbrella of DGA, they still have to be approved. And what is the approval, how does the approval take place? What do they... The, there are executives in charge of each show, and they have to sign off. On. So they look at your episodes? The producers may say, we want to hire Bethany. And then if I am known to the studio, let's say the studio is Warner Brothers and the, and the network is ABC, mm -hmm. though I don't think that happens that much. But anyway, um, uh, also the studio and the network can, has their list and can propose it to the producer, to the mm -hmm. showrunner, who may not know me and doesn't care and wants his own people or her own people. So it's... it's a lot of favoritism. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of mix and matchness going on. <laughs> you know, if, you, if you're a director who's approved by studio but not by network, then what do you do? It's almost like an actor. Very you much. You have to go through the suits, is what we used to call them, the suits in yeah. the room, and get through that 
exactly. approval process. Exactly. Oh, fascinating. You had a question? Um, yeah. Wait, can you guys hear me? Okay, there we go. Um, my question is about, uh, like, if, if you guys recall, there was a writer's strike a couple of years back, and it mm. was really bad on television. Like, the scripts were yeah. awful. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if it's, like, does it become the responsibility of the director to salvage that? Like, if you wind up getting scripts that aren't really that great because, you know, you're going off of B, C list writers, or, mm. like, how do you turn that from a, something that's obviously going wrong to something that still works to your favor? When I get the script on my first day of prep, that script has already been approved by the studio and by the network. So um, I'm not there to turn it on its head. The only thing I can do is offer my thoughts and suggestions to the showrunner. And those will get addressed, but those are at best Band-Aid fixes because we're not going to pull this thing apart at this point. So then it becomes my job to direct it in the best way that I can to dress it up um, in whatever way I can with the actor's help and with the crew's help to, to work with that script and tell the best, create the best episode that I can do. But in episodic television, I'm not gonna come in and throw that script out. That's not my job or my place. Never here, Bethany in the very back. Hi, thank you so much for coming. First of all, I'm geeking out a little bit because Parenthood is one of my favorite shows. Awesome. So that's super awesome that you're, you're working on that. Um, I'm a little starstruck. Uh, second of all, um, I'm really curious to see if there's any shows that are out there that you haven't directed yet that you've got your eye on that you'd like to direct. Hmm. Well, I haven't cracked into pay cable <laughs> yet. I haven't, I haven't been approved by HBO or Showtime, so there are some shows, you know, you know, I mentioned Tim Van Patten earlier when I was talking about White Shadow People. He is the, the director of many of the episodes of Boardwalk Empire. So I would love to do Boardwalk Empire, but I haven't been approved by HBO. His path has gone in his way, and my path goes this way. Um, interestingly, he and I, um, directed both a lot of episodes of a show in the early 90s called Touched by an Angel mm. that was in, we shot in Salt Lake City. So there we were, our paths were at the same place at that point. And then he went, he lives in New York and uh, went on to um, Sex and the City and Sopranos and now Boardwalk Empire. And also Band of Brothers, The Pacific. I mean, he's had a phenomenal career. I have too, but just in a different way. Hello, my name is TK, and I was wondering, uh, does understanding character development help you to create better scenes for um, when you're on set and you're just coming into a show and you're watching DVDs and you're, you're paying attention to each episode and you're seeing different characteristics and different things just keep changing about the character? Does that help you to create better shots and get a, a better creative mentality? Everything that I can understand about a show helps me. But in addition, um, what helps me is trying to make every moment the best it can be, the, the most full storytelling it can be, whether that's in performance or whether it's in the shot or whether it's in you know, the relationship between characters or whether it came as a Band-Aid fix as part of the script. Yes, character development, understanding that is helpful, as is every other aspect. I have to look at it all and do the absolute best, and best is most specific job I can do in every aspect of being a director. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, well, thank you all for being here today, today actually, for this, and uh, thank you, Bethany Rooney. Let's hear from Bethany Rooney. <laughs>